Hello everybody, welcome to this uh, series, Meditation, Mind and Spirituality. My name is Kokto Yip. I was an ex-Zen meditator. I did it for 20 years from 18 till I was 38. And then I became a Christian when I was 38 years old. I'm very concerned about Eastern meditation because it is widely practiced in Christendom as Christian meditation and as mindfulness in secular society. Now, Eastern spiritual worldviews, um, that pantheistic worldview where there is energy in everything and everything when conceptualized by the mind, everything is God. This worldview is imparted in meditation through neural phenomena that happens in the brain and is perceived by the mind. So, it is neural phenomena which imparts the pantheistic worldview that everything or everyone belongs to God or is God. So this is very concerning because it is not taught through words. It is something realized deep in meditation. And that's where my talks will go, to show you the science behind it. Why meditators actually feel this and uh, believe in this. The, uh, the talks are in three sections. There's neuroscience, then there's meditation, silence and nothingness, and then humanity's spiritual trajectory. But I will show you a lot of neuroscience. So neuroscience is split into two sections of almost an hour each. We will go into the neuroscience section first. I've also set up a website. Now everything you hear today is on my website. And you could uh, go to it. It's called meditationmindyourbrain.com or for people who are interested in mindfulness and the Christian perspective of mindfulness, go to mindfulofchrist.com. Neuroscience part one, it's about Eastern meditation. It is about how it alters brain function and actually deceives the mind by altering reality. Now let's understand the differentiation between Biblical meditation and Eastern meditation and its many derivatives. Its derivatives are many forms of Christian meditation hybridized with Eastern meditation. And of course, there is the secular form called mindfulness. Now, these are Eastern practices. They are to reach the silence, uh, to nothingness. They want to bring the mind into uh, a condition of non-judgment or what they call bare awareness. Now, there are many methods, following one's breath, looking at the flame or meditating on the flame of a candle, a Japanese riddle called a koon, focusing on a spot of light or thinking or meditating on mantras. All right. Let's uh, discuss the purpose of these things. When one is asked to follow one's breath, for example, that's what I did when I was doing Zen. I would be sitting relaxedly and being aware of my breath and counting it in cycles of 10. All right. So one is following one's breath and keeping the mind tranquil, silent, and not allowing other thoughts, any other thoughts. The breath, the counting of the breath, focuses the mind on the breath, which is nothing, and allowing other thoughts not to occur. That's the whole idea. So it is with mantras. Okay. Now, when I was doing it, I was also given uh, a riddle, a Japanese riddle. And the riddle goes this way. As you meditate, one asks oneself, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Now, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Absolutely nothing. So it empties the mind. And one does not do it just for minutes. It's for 
hours. So the whole objective of these things are to empty the mind. Now, if I were to ask you to focus on a spot of light, like this laser point, and on that laser point and nothing else, are you focused or are you not focused? Now, you would say you're focused on the spot of light. But the purpose of focusing on the spot of light is so that your mind excludes all other thoughts. So, if you were to think about this, you're actually starving your mind of other thoughts. You are excluding all thoughts. Your mind has excluded everything but a spot of light. So you're, you're focused on a spot of light, that's true, but you have negated everything else. And that's the entire process. And these, doing these things do strange things to the brain and then to the mind. If you were to Google um, what happens to the brain when doing meditation, this phrase, the most common phrase you will find relates to Eastern meditation where the frontal cortex tends to go offline. Now, what does it mean to take the frontal cortex offline? What it means is like this. Uh, you've got a, a mobile, a phone. You switch it to airplane mode or you switch it off. You've got a phone, but it's offline. It's not online. And the meditative process of mantras or koan or following your breath is to take your frontal cortex offline. Now, the front part of your brain, there is a part called the anterior cingulate cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex. We'll call it ACC for short. Here is a quote that captures what it does for you. A special part of the frontal cortex called the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC for short, is our neurological heart. It is here we experience love, compassion, empathy, sympathy, altruism, and the ACC is also the seat of the will, the place we choose right from wrong. Now, I ask you, as you read this and think about this, is the ACC a crucial part of your brain? A crucial part of who you are? And especially to Christians, this part is so crucial for you in worship, in being who you are as a Christian. So the ACC is crucial. Now, there are things that happen through the ACC when one does Eastern meditation. The ACC, in short, is responsible for romantic love, and the University of Montreal, Dr. Burogard, found that out. It's responsible for unconditional love. And as Christians, we know what unconditional love is, and that's the ACC. It is also the seat of the will, your determination. And it is where hope and optimism reigns. In fact, scientists have found out that um, when you are depressed, it's the amygdala that gets overactive. But when the HCC is activated, they call it the hope and optimism circuit. It is like a hard wire circuit. You put on that switch, there's hope and optimism, and the amygdala, where depression occurs, is quietened down. So the ACC is a crucial part of a healthy, uh, uh, crucial part of mental health. Now, in Yoga Nidra, in this form of yoga, there is decreased blood flow in the prefrontal, the cerebellar, and the subcortical regions. Blood to these regions actually are reduced. So the effect of yoga, yoga nidra with a reduction of blood is bliss for your brain. That's how it's advertised. But it is very sim similar to um, eating too much when blood from the brain goes to the stomach and you go into food coma. Now, the ACC, in research by these scientists, they found that in meditation, the ACC in meditation M goes down, but comes back up when you stop meditation. But in meditation, it goes down, okay? 
I, I want you to bear that in mind. And I want, because I want to show you the consequences in meditation when the ACC goes down. Andrew Newba, he looked at meditators and he came to this conclusion. The results from this study might also suggest that meditation-based practices affect beliefs and experiences through a frontal parietal network, two parts of the brain, the frontal lobe and the parietal. And we'll go into what that means. He was looking at Tibetan meditators and as they were meditating, he said, and if you look at the orientation area, it goes dramatically down in its activity during meditation practice. And then he said, we think this is the part of what is associated with someone losing that sense of self. They feel at one with God, at one with their spiritual mantra, whatever it is they are looking at. So what happens is this, as they're doing meditation, whatever method it may be, mantras or otherwise, as they begin to take the frontal lobe offline, as they begin to negate all incoming data by focusing on a mantra, a spot of light, a candle flame, whatever, as they starve their frontal lobe, the activity of the parietal lobe goes down. As they staff the frontal lobe, the activity of the parietal goes down. But at the, and at the same time, the ACC is also down, as in the previous slide. Now what happens? What is the parietal lobe? The parietal lobe is what is that orientation part of the brain. It tells you where you are in three-dimensional space. For example, you, may f you know that you are 10 feet from me, 20 feet from the ceiling, and you've got a broad sense of your body shape. You know where you are in three-dimensional space. When the parietal goes down, you lose that sense. You lose a sense of the body shape. You lose a sense of where you are. You feel as if you're one with the universe, and the universe is one with you. And so, when one's parietal goes down, one gets this sense. And Dr. Andrew Newber explained it as losing that sense of self being at one with God, or whatever it is they are looking at. And this is the point where meditators say, I feel at one with the universe. And they feel very united with everything. And this is where meditators want to go because it is a, obviously, quite a wonderful feeling. Now this is iconic of meditation. As you meditate, you are an independent drop of water. But when the parietal goes down, you drop into what they call the cosmic ocean, the cosmic sea, and you become, you disappear, yourself disappears. You become one with the whole universe. Now, Andrew Newberg sum summarized what he found by saying the correlation between the DLT PFC and the superior parietal lobe may, be, may reflect an altered sense of space. But when one is doing Eastern meditation, one does not describe one's experience as an altered sense of space. They give spiritual meaning to what they feel. And here is where spiritual meaning is given. The, um, that worldview where you feel that you're one with the universe, one with everything, you are at peace and tranquil with the whole universe, and there's no distinction between you and self, that in Hinduism is described as nirvana, for example. Now Christians getting this feeling could give it another meaning, and we will get into it, how it occurs. Now Jordan Grafman, He's a cognitive neuroscientist, director of brain injury research at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And he said, the frontal lobes are the most evolved areas of the human brain and help control and make sense of the perception, perceptual input we get from the world. Further investigation revealed that damage to a specific area of the brain, known as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, was linked markedly 
to increased mysticism. When the frontal lobe's inhibitory or control functions are suppressed, a door of perception can open, increasing chances of mystical experience. So it is from brain injury, mainly to the frontal lobe, that mystical experiences occur. And we found out that in meditation, there's less blood flow, one starves the frontal lobe. In other words, although one has a healthy frontal lobe, one shuts it down, disallows incoming data, no thought, one starves it and takes it effectively offline, as if one has a damaged frontal lobe. Now you may Google Jill Bolt Taylor. She had a massive stroke, and when she had that massive stroke, she was exercising, she had what is called a unitive consciousness. She described her, bo her body after the stroke as blending into the wall. She then felt at one with everything, and she was then uh, interviewed, and she described the me and the we in our brains. In other words, we are actually one. That's the reality, she said. But it came from us a massive stroke. And with brain damage and taking the frontal lobe offline, right, and deactivating the parietal causes these neural phenomena, which gives the impression, a false impression, I may say, of us being one with the universe. Now, James Braid, in 1840, is the founder of hypnotism. He wrote books, and his friends read the books. And James's belief was that it needs some other person to hypnotize another. But his friend said, hey, James, you know, the people in Persia and in India, in their meditation, they're self-hypnotizing themselves. And James took a look, and he said he had to admit there is no need for an exoteric influence. In other words, you can hypnotize yourself. There's no need for an external influence for someone else to do it. Now, what is hypnosis? Columbia University are telling us how it occurs. Columbia University is saying that there are two places in the frontal lobe, one called the ACC, which you've heard about. It's the ACC is about the will. And there's another part in the frontal lobe called the lateral frontal cortex. And that is responsible for awareness of reality. So let's just make it simple. There is the ACC responsible for your will, your determination. And the LFC responsible for reality. Now, Columbia University then put people under successful hypnosis. And then they were looking at the brain and they found out that the will, the ACC, and reality, the lateral frontal cortex, were decoupled. They were not working together. When will and reality are decoupled, not working together, it's successful hypnosis. Okay? Now, let me try to dramatize this somewhat for us all to understand this. The will and reality are always active for your benefit, for your defense to assess what is real and to respond to unreal suggestions, perhaps lies. So your will then is determined not to listen to a lie. Okay? Now, as you go into meditation, what happens to your frontal lobe? It's gone offline. You're starving it. Other occurrences uh, uh, occur, like the parietal going down. You feel an altered reality, and these feelings this neural phenomena are suggestive of things. Right? And in meditation, with your frontal lobe going offline and your ACC being deactivated uh, in the previous slide, you, the ACC is taken offline and therefore is not coupled to the LFC. When it's decoupled, you're open to suggestion. That's hypnotism. And the suggestion that comes through at that point depends on where you are. If you are meditating with a Hindu guru, he would say, well, you've arrived at nirvana. 
if you were meditating with a Buddhist, he would say, you are now liberated like Buddha. Now, Christians are doing this form of meditation. When Christians arrive at that altered reality, the suggestion often is, now you're in the presence of God. You are being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, one set of neural phenomena opens itself to so many different interpretations. Now, I ask you, is that dangerous? So it's a hypnotic suggestion. All right? When your mind is open, where your will is down, or your reality is down, and the suggestion comes true. So other scientists, Newberg, Iverson, Travis, said sometimes meditation results in profound changes in consciousness leading individuals into trance-type states, states of self-hypnosis or mystical states. Now, in the East, where I grew up, there were a lot of med meditators of all forms. And it's well known. In Eastern meditation, it's a sensory phenomena that launches the meditator into divinity, into things like they call Advaita, into non-dual divinity, universal one consciousness, oneness, nirvana, awakening, satori, cosmic consciousness. Eastern meditation is well known to launch one into the realm of the divine. That's what it's used for. But the West is using it somewhat differently. All right? It's about transformation, it's about self-help, it's about wellness. Now, in looking at what has happened to the brain in meditation, can one extract from it or depart from or avoid the spiritual meanings and uh, as if to sanitize it of the spiritual meanings, the various dangerous spiritual meanings, and extract from it only wellness and transformation. Dr. Andrew Newber also said this, the temporal lobes are clearly important in religious and spiritual experience. The amygdala, the hypocompus, have been shown to be particularly involved in the experience of visions, profound experiences. So in looking at the temporal lobe, Dr. Stanley Coren and Michael Persinger had this to say. They stimulated the temporal lobe with a machine, uh, magnetic resonance, and they reported how people who were put through that experiment felt these things. They sensed presences. People often interpreted these to be that of angels, a deceased being known to the subject or a group of beings of some kind. Uh, experience what they perceive as God. 80% of his participants experience a presence besides themselves. So this was from temporal lobe. And in meditation, the temporal lobe is affected. Now, it is not your mantra. That's the point of this slide. When my late Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, he did meditation for three years. Uh, he was offered by a Catholic uh, meditator, he was offered two mantras. Because they saw that he was Chinese, they offered him a Chinese mantra, Ome Tofut. But seeing that he spoke English, they offered him an English ma uh, mantra, Maranatha. Okay? So it really doesn't matter what you say with your mouth. It's what happens when you repeat a mantra and what happens to the brain. And then what happens after that, that's so important. In fact, <clears throat> meditators, gurus say, you don't have to re make it Chinese or English. You can even use Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola as a mantra. And the same things happen. So it is what happens in your brain, not what you say with your mouth. Now here are a few clips 
of my late uh, Prime Minister, having done meditation for three years, and his uh, teacher was interviewing him. And now, remember this. Lee Kuan Yew does not believe in God at all. He's made it very clear, and we all know this. But in the interview, there were these questions. The question was, has meditation given you a sense of what the spiritual values of life mean? And Mr. Lee replied, make him realize that there is an inner self. Now, Mr. Lee did not say a divine self, an inner divinity. He just said an inner self. His teacher said, and you wouldn't call that a spiritual discovery? Or a spiritual discovery, not religious. Now, what was implied here? That true self, and Mr. Lee did not believe in God, that true self was not divine. But the teacher is suggesting that it is a, nonetheless, that it is a spiritual discovery. A spiritual discovery, not religious. Now, what does that mean? It means that it does not matter if you don't believe in God. It doesn't matter if you're Hindu, Buddhist, or Christian. We all have a spiritual discovery to make. There is a divinity, a spiritualized entity in everyone. That's a waiting discovery. And it is irrespective of who you are. In fact, everyone has that inner spiritual or divine or inner divinity and that is the suggestion so you can see from this conversation that meditation is to bring one to be in touch with one's spiritual self which exists irrespective of your religion irrespective of whether you believe in god or not so this is the icon of meditators, that drop of water. As you begin to meditate, you are that independent drop of water, and then you merge into the cosmic sea. So pantheism. Pantheism is the belief where God is not God the person. God as energy. All right? God as an essence. Is in everything. God, this God, this, this, this essence is in the flowers and the trees in the air, and therefore in everyone. And for one to realize that is the purpose of meditation. And that high point of realization uh, are given names like Advaita, Nirvana, Satori, Oneness, Liberation, Enlightenment, Cosmic Consciousness, Universal Consciousness. So the word non dual is applied to this. In other words, um, if there are now, let's say, uh, 200 people in this room, when we get there, all of us in meditation, we are all one. There is not two of us, not 200 of us, we are all one. So it's non-dual. And this is the high point of unitive consciousness. And that's pantheism. But with Christians doing this Eastern meditation, that high point is described as oneness with God as a person, not God as energy or God as essence. So here is extreme panentheism. In other words, the belief here is that God, yes, he created everything, but yet, and I'd rather say, and he is in everything. The substance of God is in everything, and everyone from birth, they're suggesting, no one excluded. So here is divinity gifted from birth. What it does do is it, it, it ignores the reality of humanity having fallen in Eden, having been seduced and lied to by the serpent. It insists that humanity still has something good in them, so much good that it's defined as divine or immortal, waiting to be discovered. 
So extreme panentheism suggests that, yes, God created the universe, and He loves and He penetrates and saturates the whole universe, and no one is excluded. If that was the case, then we do not need salvation. We do not need God from the outside. We do not need to be converted. We do not need to share in the death and resurrection of Christ. Because what it insists is that there is still that divine nature waiting to be discovered, waiting to be developed without Christ. So, they believe, the meditators believe, the Eastern meditators believe that meditation will make religion obsolete. Karl Rana, a Jesuit priest, says this, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or he will not exist at all. So what he's saying is either you are a mystic or you're not Christian. You've got to, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to be a mystic. Now, Father Richard Raw, another uh, teacher of Christian mysticism, all right, he is amalgamating Catholic meditation with Eastern meditation. And he calls this non-dual mysticism, or he calls it Christian mysticism. And in his uh, devotional, recent devotional on 16th July, it was titled Christian Mysticism. Christ is everywhere, penetrates and saturates the universe. And he says this, it poignantly demonstrates what I call the Christian mystery or the, the Christ mystery. The indwelling of the divine presence in everyone and everything since the beginning of time as we know it. So since the beginning of time, since Eden, he negates the fall. That this Christ, this divine presence is still in everyone and everything. Waiting to be discovered in Eastern meditation. So this is how it is sold. Dallas Willard, he said this, <clears throat> Spiritual is not just something we ought to be. It is something we are and cannot escape. In other words, well, the presence of God is in everything and everyone. You can't escape it. All right? God's substance is everywhere and in everyone waiting to be discovered. So Richard Foster works with Renova, so does uh, Dallas Willard. They're in spiritual formation and uh, also working with Father Richard Rohr. So the expressions of presumed inborn immortal divine soul, these expressions are everywhere. The atheist who doesn't believe in God, when he meditates, he says he discovers his true self or his inner self. But whatever he says, it is still something better than who he is. In Eastern religion, they are very blatant. They say there is an inner divinity. Scientists knew, uh, uh, um, still meditate to discover or to enhance or to develop that neural network of God consciousness. They believe that as we evolve, there is already that inbuilt neural network of spiritual consciousness, of God consciousness. So as meditation enhances and strengthens that, that's how they believe. It's nonetheless an expression of something better, something far better, something spiritual. Okay? And Christianity in Eastern hybridized meditation this claims to discover the Holy Spirit within, God's presence, the image of God, and immortal soul. But here, we must make the distinction. It is fine if we are truly converted that after we share in the death and resurrection of Christ, that we have, we indeed have the Spirit. But the way it is sold is, it doesn't matter if you are backslidden, nominal, still unconverted. Meditation is the sure way to discover Christ within. So meditation is sold as a method to God. 
But is it? Is that possible that it is a meditative process? It is not. It is an interactive process of faith that brings us to God, or God brings himself to us. So let me define the terms as we go forward. Pantheism. Pan means all. Theism means God. Here, pantheism means the whole universe, nothing excluded, is God. So in meditation, we discover that we are one with the whole universe and that we are all defined as God. Not as a person, but as a consciousness, as energy, as an essence. Now, extreme panentheism. Pan means all, theism means God, but there is the added word en, E-N, which means within, inborn. This is God here, God is presented as a person. Okay? And this person of God is in, within, one. So this is more appealing to the Christian. Pantheism is more of Buddhism, Taoism, and so forth. This appeals to Christianity. And I use the word extreme because, yes, for the converted, God is with us. And that's for sure. That's what we rely on. But what extreme panentheism suggests is that irrespective of who you are and your religious condition, everyone has God in them from the very beginning, without question. So these are presumptions. Everyone has an inborn, immortal so, so, pantheism, where God is in essence and everything is God, is equally dangerous to extreme panentheism, where it says, yes, God created the universe, but he so saturates and penetrates the universe, nothing is excluded. So this is where God is a person, he penetrates, this is where God is not a person and is an essence, but they are equally dangerous in concept. Now this is uh, Thich Nhat Han. He is a Zen master. He said, we do not have to look for God. We do not have to look for our ultimate dimension or Nirvana because we are Nirvana. We are God. Now when I was doing Zen, and he's a Zen master, we never talked about God. We talked about unitive consciousness. Yes, we talked about our mind being pure, yes, but we never characterize God. So Zen, which is pantheism, is going panentheistic because he speaks of the person of God. And then Thich Nhat Hanh writes many books, perhaps a hundred or so. And in two of his books, this one, he says, Jesus and Buddha are brothers. And this one, living Buddha, living Christ. So he sees them being one in spirit. Uh, and the effort is to bring pantheism and panentheism into middle ground. And this is a quote from Father Richard Rohr. I'd call him a panentheist. He said, we either honor God in all things, or we soon lose the basis of seeing God in anything. In other words, you either become a, an extreme panentheist or you lose being a Christian entirely. Now yoga, there is a word in yoga, in Hinduism, that is namaste. Now what does namaste mean when they greet each other with their hands folded? Namaste. It means I see the divine in you, or I honor the divine in you, and you repeat it back to me. So it's a process of greeting, yes, but it insists that there is divinity in each other. It's a presumption. Now, it's already the fifth International Yoga Day promoted by India with the support of the United Nations. And the tagline is, an all-inclusive humanity. Why? 
because it is presumed that everyone has that inner divinity. So whether you meditate and, has, and have discovered it, but if you have not meditated and have not discovered your inner divinity, nonetheless, we are all the same. Whether you discovered it or you have not, it is an all-inclusive humanity. It's a union of polarities. There are no opposites. All are one. But I will go on to explain how even polar opposites, amazing polar opposites, like good and evil, are one. That's where it's going. That's where the spiritual danger is. So that's the meaning of Namaste. That's the meaning of Yoga Day. The, and towards an all-inclusive humanity. Now, Dalai Lama asks this, what is love? Love, he suggests, is the absence of judgment. Now, is that true? <clears throat> I want to make this point absolutely uh, to, to, to dissect this point. Okay, now, he said, in love, there is no judgment. In other words, let's uh, imagine that here we have uh, people on this side and people on that side. And let's say you are country A and you're country B. And you're at war. And I offer to spy for you against them. And then, perhaps a month later, I would offer them to spy for them against you. I do not judge. I do not differentiate. And the question I want to ask is, do I love you? Or do I love you? And the answer really is, I don't love either of you. I couldn't care less. I do not differentiate. I am completely indifferent to both of you. So, in a spiritual sense, we, when we love, we differentiate. We differentiate between good and evil. We differentiate who we want to help. We want to differentiate to protect ourselves in the first place, to go the right way. So differentiate, differentiation is crucial. So the statement is very seductive. What is love? In love, there is no judgment. It's a very seductive, but it is a very untrue statement. Now, so all this meditative stuff, the um, starving of the frontal lobe, taking it offline, uh, added to the phenomena, the brain phenomena of the parietal going down, it's very um, seductive. It causes the mind to be unable to differentiate. And what comes out of this is the pantheistic worldview. It's about the universe, uh, uni unity and diversity, where tolerance will fit, and they're all good things so far. Tolerance, respect, compassion, love. But let me ask you, can we fit truth in here? Truth is distinct, right? When things are generalized, undifferentiated, like tolerance, respect, compassion, they are, and love, they're all encompassing. But if, if we try to fit truth, distinctive truth in there, then it, be, it gets muddled up with other truths. And if all things are true, then nothing is true. So a distinctive truth cannot fit in there, much as it is very beautiful. What about Christ? Can Christ fit into a unity in diversity of all faiths? All faiths. Even faiths that reject Christ for who he is. No, he can't. Christ cannot fit in there. Truth cannot fit in there. But this whole thing is very appealing. And this whole thing is how the mind evolves in Eastern meditation, in a pan pantheistic worldview, where all things are gathered together and sold as unitive consciousness and sold as love. 
Ellen White. She says, He, Satan, therefore transforms himself into an angel of light and works upon the mind to allure from the only safe and right path, the science of phrenology, psychology, and mesmerism, which is an old word for hypnotism, are the channel through which Satan comes more directly to this generation and works with that power which is to characterize his efforts near the close of probation. To characterize means this is the type of deception, the main type of deception that he will use, hypnotism included. Now, the Bible in Malachi 2.17 says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, Wherein have we wearied him? When you say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, where is the God of judgment? So Malachi is saying, we need to differentiate between good and evil. If we think, if we should even think, that God delighteth in those who do, doeth evil. We are negating God. There is no God. There is no God of judgment. That's what he's saying. Now, in Psalms 19, Psalms 19 has 14 verses. And in verse 14, King David ended by saying this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So the first 13 verses, including this one, is King David's meditation. Now I want to run through this, his meditative process, his meditative thoughts, and his outcome. And you judge for yourself the difference between King David's meditation, biblical meditation. I believe this is the gold standard of biblical meditation, to think about the way he meditated, the outcomes, and compare that with the Eastern outcome. Okay? So King David starts off by meditating upon the universe, upon the stars and the sun. And before long, he said, the heat of the sun, no one can escape. All right? And then he began to see the sun as a bridegroom, as a strong man who comes to run a race. Now, if you were to see the sun as a bridegroom, to personify the sun as a bridegroom, who do you think that bridegroom is? It is Christ coming for a wedding, coming for his church. Now, even at this stage, I ask you, compared to a person who does Eastern meditation, when he meditates on the universe, he will say, I am one with the universe. That King David say that or even think that. No, he was an observer of the universe and he thought to himself, this is the handiwork of God. This is evidence of God. And the heat of the sun was like the word of God or the love of God that penetrates and searches out and, and, and benefits everyone. No one can hide from it. And then he personifies the sun as Christ coming for a wedding. And I'm sure he began to see himself as one of the bride or the bride. And then he began to meditate on the statutes, on judgment. And he said, these things, and on the law, and he said, these things are very good, better than honey, better than fine gold. It gives warning and reward. Now, he is meditating and he is definitely thinking of a wedding. He wants to be pure. These things give warning and reward. And then he said, Lord, show me my secret faults. Now, what are secret faults? Secret faults are faults that our deceitful heart would keep away, keep away from ourselves, recognizing them as faults. But his heart was open to God. He trusted God. He loved God. There's going to be a wedding. He wants to be pure. And so, Lord, show me even my secret faults, that I may correct them, that you may help me to correct them, that you are my strength and my redeemer. You will help me to correct them. 
And then he said, reveal to me my presumptuous sins, that I may be innocent from the great transgression. So he began to be transparent to the God who loves him, who is his strength, that he may be made innocent. Now, this is the outcome of biblical meditation, where one discerns, where one discerns not only about external good and evil, but one searches one, one's heart in relation to the strength and the love of God, that one can see ourselves as the way we need to see ourselves before God, that we may call upon Him, that the Lord is our strength and our Redeemer, that we may be ready, prepared for the wedding. So the outcome is now compared to the Eastern outcome. Now the Eastern outcome is where there is already inborn divinity. So however evil you may be in your deeds, there is that divinity waiting to be discovered. So, King David wanted to know his secret faults, his presumptuous sins, and he was looking externally to God to help him. Eastern meditation suggests that everyone has an inner divinity awaiting development. So, one in Eastern meditation does not look out to God from heaven. They presume their divinity and in meditation they claim that what is not there and in Christianity we as we look into the fallen nature as we look into our heart into how we are made in the likeness of sinful flesh we know that even when we meditate we can't discover anything good within so God comes from without so when you compare these meditative outcomes, their premise, you will discover that the East is flawed. That biblical meditation tells us how we in humility can trust the God who is infinite love. Now, in Buddhism, it says this, the root of suffering is attachment. So, if we are detaching from suffering, why is it so dangerous? That's a question I want to, to ask. And I want to um, describe why the East meditates, why it is a detachment is a solution to suffering. Let me just dramatize this, okay? If we fear poverty, we grasp at wealth. And the fear of poverty and the grasping of wealth is attachment. And that gives suffering. For example, if we are sick, we grasp at health, but we become desperate. We are fearful of death. So by, by fearing uh, uh, sickness, we grasp at health. We may not have, have enough health and we may not last. And that is suffering. So if, if in meditation, as they suggest, we can detach from grasping, then we can find in a peace. So, when we, in meditative detachment of the East, when we they detach, those are, those become illusions, and the inner, inner um, peace is the truth, okay? And it goes so fast, so in the meditative process, it goes so far as to say, when you detach, don't even be attached to your detachment. All right? Now, so this detachment is central to the Eastern practices and the Eastern philosophy. So nirvana, what's the meaning of nirvana? It's a transcendental state, that state of peace, in which there is neither suffering nor desire, nor sense of self, and the subject is released from the effects of karma and the cycle of death and rebirth. It represents the final goal of Buddhism. Now, in the Buddha story, Buddha was a prince in a palace. The king and queen loved him, did not want him to see death. 
or old age. They brought in young servants, retired old servants. He grew up, got married, had children, and never knew suffering nor death. But one day, the account goes, he followed a charioteer out of the palace walls. And for the first time, he saw death, he saw a corpse, and he was a he was depressed. And to release himself from the suffering, he meditated. And when he meditated, he was liberated. That point of liberation is when he does not sense polar opposites, life and death, good and evil. The brain was uh, altered and he felt at one with the universe and the universe was at one with him. But it was a state of inf infinity. If you were if you lost your parietal lobe, your loss of your position in three-dimensional space, do you have a sense, you know, space-time? If you did not have your position in three-dimensional space, you also lose space-time. You begin, begin to feel infinite, eternal. All right? So when the mind is in that state, can one differentiate between life and death? No. So, Rebirth, cycles of death and rebirth is distinction between life and death. In an eternal state, by a trick of the mind, by neural phenomena, one cannot sense that rebirth. One cannot sense life and death. Therefore, he, was, he said he was freed from the cycles of rebirth. Now, when the ACC in Eastern meditation goes down. Right? The ACC differentiates right from wrong, good from evil. When the ACC goes down in Eastern meditation, can one, when the ACC goes down, differentiate between good and evil? The discernment is lowered dramatically. So dramatically that in Buddhism, it's about karma. Karma is the account of good and evil. If you've got too much evil, you must do a lot of good to offset it, to balance it out. If not, you reincarnate into your next life into an inferior uh, entity, like a rat or a pig. Now, when the mind, the ACC, goes down, one cannot differentiate between good and evil. One therefore loses the ability to differentiate or to discern karma, good and evil. So, in Eastern meditation, with the loss of uh, the deactivation of the ACC and the parietal going down, that infinite feeling, one loses the sense of discernment of good and evil and life and death. And therefore, it is free, it's freedom or liberty from the effects of karma and rebirth. So this is where the, um, the pantheistic worldview comes in. That, the, that one becomes infinite and becomes one with the whole universe. And that's, here is described the spiritual danger. So Buddha's non-dual, that pantheistic worldview is dangerous because it is applied to good and evil, to not discerning good and evil, between not discerning life and death and heaven or hell. So Buddha's non-dual is captured into this thing called yin-yang. Now, what does yin-yang mean? Yin-yang means this. Where polar opposites, life and death, are not opposites. They are actually merged indistinctly into one. They are always together. So the black is the bad. The white is the good. The little white dot is the good that's in the bad, bad because that is black. The black dot in the white is that's the bad in the good. And when you put it together, here's life. So the definition there is life is emergence of good and evil. And that is Taoistic, is Buddhist. And so here you get the sense that what is being suggested that all is God and God is one. And that is universal consciousness. Now, the biblical worldview is this. There was oneness in Eden. It was an unfallen state. We, or Adam and Eve, 
at that time had an unfallen nature. And there was a tree of life. And there was the seduction and the fall. And after the fall, the tree of knowledge of good and evil had its dominance. We had a fallen nature. We, people were then, Adam and Eve, were then denied access to the tree of life. And this sense of immortality was gone. For example, when they were in the garden before the fall, they took off the tree of life and they lived on and on, on and a dependent immortality. But after the fall, they were denied access to the tree of life. And therefore, they, were, they became immortal. And our access back to the tree of life is only in the New Jerusalem. So, between the fall and now and in the future, we do not have immortality. So the suggestion of a divine soul, an immortal soul, just doesn't exist. It's a lie. It's a lie that is now suggested or made as if it is true in Eastern meditation. And that's where the danger is. So Eastern meditation places humankind or individuals as if the fall did not take place and places us here as if we have immortality to discover, as if we have an unfallen nature to develop. So Eastern meditation negates the fall and places humans here. So if Christians were to do Eastern meditation, they are subscribing, they believe in God being a person, so they subscribe to extreme panentheism, and when they have that neural phenomena, they will not discern between sin and righteousness, God and Satan. They will lose that discernment. And therefore, hybridized Christian meditation is dangerous. So what I've just told you is in my website, meditation-mindyourbrain.com. And if you want to focus on mindfulness alone, go to mindfulofchrist.com. Or you can find me on YouTube and on Audioverse. So thank you very much. Um, following this, I'll go into part two, into uh, Eastern values, into Eastern beliefs, and into more, somewhat into mindfulness. So I hope you will follow this series. I hope to see you again. Bye-bye.